You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 146 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin Bruner, and this is a roundtable edition. And joining me for this episode is the one and only Chris Robley. Chris, how you hey, doing? Hey, I'm good. And it was just yesterday that I was, well, two days ago now, I guess, that I was in your office in Portland, Oregon, and now I'm in Portland, Maine. Yeah, we couldn't figure out, you know, logistics and timing to actually record this while you're in the office. So <laughs> we couldn't figure out how to just be in the same room and set up a mic. So too too much pressure. I like yeah. <laughs> I like talking to mysterious voices across the internet. Yeah. Um, well, well, here I am. Yeah. So, lots of stuff going on. You are about to launch a pledge music campaign. I am, and I've been working with my. I think they call them campaign. What do they call them? Campaign consultants. Yeah, I believe so. Or manager. Campaign manager. That's what. Yeah. We're working with my my guy at Pledge Music and. And he's kind of helping me. Uh, I had the video edited and a video description, and he made some suggestions to, um, to on editing those. That thankfully that wasn't anything too drastic. So I'm going to do that over the weekend, and hopefully launch the campaign maybe in a week or two. Yeah. After you get done uh, with this, I think we should uh, do um, a, 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 a whole fan funded or pre-sales campaign, if you will, uh, <laughs> uh, wrap up and kind of give our, our take on it. Cause, uh, this will be, have you done one before? This is your first no, one. No, this is my first time. So this will and, be your first one. Yeah. And I've been like anyone that listens to this podcast for a while knows I've been basically just putting it off for a couple of years now. So yeah, it's this, time. This is my, the fun My daughter record. is older. I have, <laughs> yeah, fun to record. I made it five years and, ago. Uh, you know, I was in, <laughs> It wasn't that long ago, but I had a daughter, you know, it kind of made me put music a little on the back burner, but now I've got some, some time to, to actually put the record out. So yeah. it's happening. Yeah. So I, I look forward to see, seeing how that goes and it'll be interesting to regroup after that is finished. And then you and I can have, uh, uh, our, our best advice on, uh, running a campaign that, uh, we can come up with. Um, cause it and, is and hopefully the title will be, um, uh, running successful campaigns. Hopefully. <laughs> hey, you can, fingers are crossed. It's possible to learn a lot from a campaign that fails too. So, but I, I don't want to. I, I, I don't want to learn not, those lessons. <laughs> yeah, don't. I hope that's not. I'm not saying that's you. I'm sure yours will be wildly successful. Um, <laughs> in fact, you in your video you are uh, given high praise as a musical genius. So yeah, I know. I was a li- actually I. I forget if I asked you about that, but I was a little hesitant to put that in because, you know, that was totally unsolicited. He just said that. And I'm like, is that really overselling it? But then I thought after, you know, this guy, the producer of the record, he said it, his girlfriend who was filming him saying it basically put her finger in front of the camera and said, Chris, put that on the video. So I thought that gave me a little bit of distance from, you know, overselling. Yeah, you you weren't holding him at gunpoint, telling him to say that. So <laughs> no, I was three thousand miles away. Yeah. All right. Well, we are going to be talking about our best touring advice today, and not only our best touring advice. We've started doing some Twitter chats. If you're on Twitter, you should uh, join us. It's looking like we're going to start doing them every second Wednesday of the month. We might increase the frequency. We're still trying to figure it out. You can follow at CD Baby online or uh, myself at K Bruner uh, or Chris. What is your Twitter handle? It's just at Chris Robley. Okay. L E Y. Yeah. So follow follow the three of us, and we kind of are heading up that Twitter chat. And uh, the the hashtag we're using is DIY Musician, and it's been uh, quite an experience to do a Twitter chat. This is uh, only the second one that I've. Um, I've, I've watched Twitter chats before, but this is, uh, something new to kind of host and help participate and drive the conversation. And the, the first one was a wild ride because uh, we had the topic was a little <laughs> too broad and 
I, I got like five minutes behind the conversation or 10 minutes at one point. But this last one, we did one more focused on touring. And it was it was actually a, a really cool time to to chat with other musicians and people sharing advice. And so we're going to we're going to share some of that in today's podcast. But uh, be on the lookout for future Twitter chats. Uh, if you don't get our emails, you should go to the DIY Musician blog or go over to members.cdbaby.com. Um, but if you go to our blog, there's a big thing at the top of the page that sign up for our email uh, list. We There's lots of great information we send out, but you'll also get notices about um, the next Twitter chat. So that was a lot of fun and a great way to kind of pull together some advice that we're going to discuss later in the episode. But now... Let's get to some news. Music. Music. News. This week, YouTube sent a letter to creators signaling the imminent launch of their ad free paid subscription service called Music Key. Rumored to be priced at $10 per month. YouTube will let creators place videos behind a paywall so that only paid subscribers view them. Lower price subscriptions for specific categories like music are also a possibility. YouTube's music and video subscription service Music Key remains in beta with a $7.99 monthly charge. No specific release date announced yet. The second worst kept secret in music tech, the launch of an iTunes streaming service is expected to launch this coming June 2015. And what would be the biggest change to its music strategy in years Apple is pressing ahead with a sweeping overhaul of its digital music services that would allow the company to compete directly with streaming upstarts like Spotify. Apple is working with Beats engineers and executives to introduce its own subscription streaming service. The company is also planning an enhanced iTunes radio that may be tailored to listeners in regional markets. And if Apple gets what it wants, more splashy new albums that will be on iTunes before they are available anywhere else. The company also made a musician a point man for overhauling the iPhone's music app to include the streaming music service, as opposed to an engineer. Trent Reznor, the Nine Inch Nails frontman, who was the chief creative officer for Beats, is playing a major role in redesigning the music app. So uh, lots going on over at Apple, and the the, the worst kept secret is that it's clearly going to be a June launch. (laughs) Finally, in what was probably one of the most awkward product launch announcement events, Jay-Z, along with numerous other artists, including Madonna, members of Arcade Fire, Beyonce, Daft Punk, and more, announced the launch of Tidal, a new music streaming service. Alicia Keys took the podium at the launch event and described Tidal as the first ever artist-owned global music and entertainment platform. According to Keys, the goal of the venture is to create a better music service and a better listening experience for fans and artists alike. The service boasts high-fidelity music streaming and is hoping to use their pool of artist owners to deliver exclusive releases only available for the Tidal platform. The Hi-Fi version of Tidal will cost users $19.99 a month. If you use CD Baby to deliver your music to the streaming services, your music will be available on the Tidal platform. I th- I th- so that's that's the news. It's uh, as I was putting it together, it was interesting. It's all streaming related. All streaming, I know. I think um, title like the sort of the basic uh, premise of it being super high fidelity streams is is exciting. Uh, the price tag is a little bit much to get used to at first, but and, and there's no free option either. So <clears throat> they they say they're trying to make it more artist friendly, have better payouts, uh, but we'll see. And exclusivity that that's the other. Interesting thing is that, uh, you know, with um, the launch, uh, eminent launch of an iTunes streaming service, uh, which, um, you know, everyone is saying is, is going to be June. I think their worldwide developer conference is in June and it's expected that it happens then. Whether or not it's available right away is another story, but uh, it, it seems like it's things are pointing to that direction. But uh, iTunes is hoping to have tons of exclusive content and basically crush Spotify. So it's kind of uh, interesting because Spotify has become the whipping boy for uh, for all things <laughs> streaming. <laughs> Titles here saying they're more artist friendly. Uh, Apple's boasting that they have all these 
uh, you know, users with their credit cards already. And if like even a small percentage of them, I think I, I forget the percentage people were saying, uh, I think it was in single digits, even a single digits of a, of a percentage uh, subscribe that it'll be a major boost to the industry. Um, we'll see. And then YouTube is launching theirs and, and everyone's saying, but everything's already available on YouTube anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm curious if the... Uh you said the thing about some exclusive content behind it. We're not exclusive, but just that it's uh, protected behind a paywall. I'm wondering how many people will actually do that because there's such value in getting your content to everyone via yeah, YouTube. And it's interesting to, 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 to try and understand or figure out who they're allowing this option to. Um, I got the email from YouTube, um, but it, I'm not sure why I got it. Honestly, because um, t- uh, typically they would only send these kind of announcements in way in the past. They used to have YouTube partners before they had um, things like content ID and, and networks that you could join. And uh, you had to reach a certain level to become a partner. And I think it with one of my channels, I just kept trying and they finally let me. But I don't know. Uh, I don't know why I got the email. So I'm not as sure if that really is going to be an option for everybody because that's, you know, YouTube. I don't know what they feel about like suddenly like a very popular channel puts everything behind the paywall. That might be good and it might not be. Yeah. I mean, I have no idea. It's just it's interesting to speculate about because the whole point of YouTube all these years has been that everything is free and it goes everywhere to everyone all around the world. And then suddenly you're, you know, yeah. just, just trying to funnel people into a subscription model all of a sudden. Like, I don't know if people are so used to how it's been working that they'll be reluctant to pay. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah. It, the, to me, the secret sauce of YouTube has always been user-generated content. It's not been the... Uh, you know, HBO creating a channel on YouTube and uh, them using that as a platform where that's where, you know, YouTube is trying to go that direction. But the thing that has always made YouTube interesting and unique is that you'll find content uh, that won't find a place in the mainstream, like cat videos or how to videos or, um, you know, more a lot, a lot of various hobbies and things uh, that people do that they kind of document that, uh, are interesting to watch. And there are a lot of cool channels that are more professionally produced that would be on topics that you wouldn't necessarily see a cable channel spending money um, to, you know, to invest in creating a programming around. Um, To me, that's kind of what makes YouTube work. Um, If it just becomes another, hey, pay to have access to everything, I'm not sure how that'll go for them. And I don't think that's what they necessarily want. Yeah. Well... We'll, we'll soon see. And, and the title thing, man, if, if, if uh, anyone listening has not watched that press conference, <laughs> that is, I mean, it's literally, I was, I was watching it in my office and it's like, I just started getting so uncomfortable. I just had to look away. I mean, you just, it was like a cult meeting, wasn't it? it? it like a, or, or some sort of rally, like a cultish rally. It was so weird. I mean, I don't even know who the people in the audience were. It was like, they looked like they were there for a concert and they, there's this whole awkward beginning of it being live and and them not having worked out all the the <laughs> the production elements and then it was like ten minutes to announce all the artists. Well, if anyone so, hasn't wasn't paying super close attention at the time, it didn't work in terms of getting favorable press. Like I I searched for a positive review of the launch and I don't think I found one. Yeah, I read. I, Articles on Wired and TechCrunch and all over the place of just basically bashing the event. So, yeah, it was it was not, I think, well thought out. Besides Alicia's Alicia Keys' uh, little speech, which lasted just like a minute or two, there really wasn't anything except them all standing there awkwardly while music played. And <laughs> and what was weird is it was a Radiohead song that they were playing. It wasn't even like I don't know. It, was, it just. And they all signed some document that it's not like it was the Declaration of Independence or anything. It was just like, I don't even know what they signed. <laughs> well, the funny the other thing, you know, it keeps getting touted as this artist owned service, which technically, I guess, is true. They are all artists. But I'm kind of like, you're not really you're more of a brand at this point. Like when you, you know, Jay-Z obviously is an artist and Beyonce is an artist. But like, 
I would usually think of artist owned in 2015 as something that means like the everyman artist. Like, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it has a, it had like an elitist quality to it, I guess that it doesn't seem very artist owned. And that's what most people were bashing them, them for. And look from an artist perspective and uh, most of those people on that stage, I would recognize as, as artists that just have, you know, they've, they've connected with people and built a giant audience and uh, so, you know, that on that level, them having interest in creating a platform that better supports that art, you know, it takes people at the top to kind of get things moving. So I understand that. But yeah, they they should have rolled out with with some more everyman folks and not <laughs> not just, hey, hey, the 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 top, you know, point zero zero one percent of of artists who are all making millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, we're angry that we're not making more. That it, it kind of just felt a little bit like um, Lars Ulrich going after Napster folks <laughs> back in the day. It, there's a way to do it in a way that says that your concern is for the stability of the industry moving forward, and there's a way that you can do it that just makes it sound like you're just grabbing more cash. Sure, and it, and it could have been the same people, but if they just invited more you know, mid-level or even like totally like independent buzz bands, but that are totally indie, like it seemed like it would have gone more towards uh, conveying that message. Yeah, because it, it really felt like, you know, especially with the dramatic entrances, it felt like this is about us, not about the artistic community, where if they had gotten a better cross-section of artists like and kind of come out more humbly and saying, hey, this is an important issue. This isn't about propping ourselves up and like, oh, look, we've got this person. Who's behind door number three now? <laughs> that's what it it's, felt like. It's Chris Martin. Yeah. And then and then it's like, so anyway, it's worth it's worth watching. I'd love to get people's opinion of it. I mean, it, it, it 1999, I am curious about the the high fidelity aspect because I am I am interested to see if you know I Spotify the one thing I don't like about it is the audio quality it just drives me crazy um, but I am curious if at 1999 if if the high fidelity is really worth it and without a free tier you know it's going to be hard for title to build an audience I mean uh, I was at South by Southwest and somebody from uh, one of the companies we've mentioned in the news said, I can't believe that uh, nobody's talking about uh, Beats anymore. And I said, um, well, that's because nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly because you, if it, it's not free. And once Apple bought it, that everyone assumed that it was going away. So it's hard to get rally, you know, rally around something that you assume is just going to be shut down. Um, even if, who knows if that's true, the Beats brand is definitely going away or if they're integrating it somehow. But anyway, so... Uh, without a free tier, Beats, it was hard for them to gain traction, and, and uh, people like free stuff. So anyway, I'd love to get people's opinions on uh, these news items and what you're feeling about streaming, if it's good for the, the industry, bad for the industry. Uh, you can d- pretty much on a daily basis do a search and find people at both extremes of that argument. Um so if you'd like to call our listener line, it's 360-524-2209. Or, oh, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Or they can email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com, and uh, maybe we'll share it on the show. I had a, uh, a note that we could add to the uh, YouTube music key thing, which I don't think you mentioned. Um, when it first was announced, we uh, CD Baby then announced that um, if you were in our sync licensing catalog, your music would be available there. But now it's um, we've basically added it just as a streaming digital partner. So if, you're, if your music's available on Spotify and Rhapsody through CD Baby, then it'll also be on YouTube. Yep. So YouTube, Tidal... Uh, you're covered and app, whatever Apple has up their sleeve, you're covered for all of it if you're with CD Baby. And we don't charge you extra for that privilege. So <laughs> um, that's why you should use us. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about our best touring advice. And as I said at the top of the show, this sort of came out of the, the Twitter conversation that we had this week, the Twitter chat, and um, there was lots of great stuff that was said. And so I started just kind of 
putting it down in little bullet points and realized there was a lot of different groupings that could be made and and that it's just kind of uh, fun to talk through there. And, and some of the stuff was simple little items, but very valuable information. And and uh, and we're still kind of building out the list, so we'll probably turn it into a blog post and get it posted on the DIY Musician blog. But uh, where do you want to start this at, Chris? Um, w- well, one thing I was thinking we could do is um, the Double Clicks, who is a CD Baby artist that tours quite often. Uh, they wrote an article a while ago uh, for us that was a had a lot of good tips about booking your tour, like kind of before you even get on the road. Um, and then they weighed in on our Twitter chat too. So I was thinking we could mention a few of their bits of All advice. Right. Well, let, let's start there. Well, the first thing that they do is they released a bunch of music online for free. And they um, tried to look at the analytics of who was downloading it and who was listening. And then they used that to basically figure out where they should be touring. Um, and uh, once they had kind of said, all right, well, we have a lot of people in Chicago and Kansas City and whatever else, then they kind of made a um, which is just a basic tour itiner- you know, sort of an imaginary itinerary of cities. And then the second thing they would do is write to their fans in those cities and say, hey, we're coming through Chicago. Where should we play? So then they had even more data, which they could say, like, okay, these are the types of venues that our our fans are going to be excited to go to. And then the third thing that does is when they contact the venue saying, hey, we're the double clicks and, you know, we're thinking about coming through Chicago on such and such dates, they can also say, and our fans have already told us that they'd be excited to come see us there. So, like, the venue... The talent buyer is like, all right, sweet. You kind of built in successful night. So I thought that was a good starter tip. Yeah, that is good. I think in 2015 and beyond, if you're just randomly booking gigs or trying to randomly book gigs around the country, whatever country you may live in, uh, you're doing it wrong <laughs> because there's too much you can do to arm yourself with information to 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 one better negotiate shows Two, find like what they were talking about finding the places where their fans are and uh and yeah just kind of do some research to figure out how we can put together some success as opposed to just hey we got this offer in some random city we have no information to base any idea off of whether this will be successful or a failure, but hey, it's something to put on the calendar. That's how a, a lot of things had happened in the past, and I think there's just too much information available that you don't need to do that anymore. Although, uh, on, on a topic that we kind of covered a few episodes ago where you're sort of trying to gauge whether a gig is worth it, there have been gigs on tour that I've played that I expected to be awful and ended up being you know, maybe my best night on that tour. And that led to me having connections with other bands in other cities that were around that area that like, I'm talking about a gig in Modesto specifically that the gig went well. And then I met all these musicians that then hooked me up in Sacramento and Merced and, um, on future tours. So you can't have the random, you know, the random success. So, yeah, well, and I wouldn't say that what I was saying at the top when, or or saying just a second ago where, you're doing it wrong if you're not using data. You you want what you're, you know, going out on tour is a risk. You are rolling the dice uh, that um, you will come back hopefully making a lot more than you spent doing it. Uh, that's usually what people's goal are. You might have a different goal. Um, but so you're trying to minimize the risk. So you're always going to have some dates where you're going to have to fill in. And, and it's just whatever information you can use to better understand and reduce the risk and know, hey, I've got these five dates that I know are going to be big. They're probably going to be full. They're going to be the money dates that are going to pay for this whole thing. And then I've got days in between that I can fill in. And, you know, there's this city I haven't played at before that that might be, you know, a more risky looking gig, but it might turn into something great. It's just a matter of kind of understanding what you're getting yourself into so you can make better decisions about uh, the success of the tour. I think, you know, the idea of a lot of folks has been this romanticized version of getting out on the road and it is fun. And, and I love road trips. Uh, it's one of my favorite ways to travel. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, you want to be able to do it again and that takes money. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, you don't want to have to come back from a tour and then spend the next year paying it off. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there are, you know, look in your CD Baby account, see where people are buying your mon- uh, your music. Um, look at the iTunes trending reports we provide, which is it's interesting. In iTunes trending reports, they provide zip code data, but they don't provide that in the actual sales report. So go pull those iTunes trending reports and then uh, do a little crunching on zip codes and see where people are coming from. And uh, then they're, also, they're, they're all in Nigeria. Yeah, <laughs> my biggest fan base is in Nigeria. <laughs> hey, when that Nigerian prince gets to the U.S., I'm going to be set for life. <laughs> but uh, then also, like Pandora, if you sign up for their artist uh, service, which is a bit of a process, um, they provide data for where people are listening. So that's all useful information. Back in the day of Small Town Poets' first album release, uh, our album randomly was selling well in Portland and Seattle and the band was based out of Georgia and we had never played in the Northwest or even been close to the Northwest. And so suddenly we were booking shows up there and they were all selling out. And that was, we never would have done that without data to, to kind of point us to where the fans were. Cool. So I, I've got a few things here. I kind of, Oh, you mentioned the double clicks they waited on our Twitter chat and we're talking about how they got fans to sponsor their their tour vehicle and they got like it looked like some magnetic thing and they wrote everybody's name on it that uh, helped sponsor them with gas money and and tour money. It's brilliant. So and then the, that gives them uh, more stuff to share on social media and on their blog too. Yep. Pictures of all those names. Um, let's see what you know. One thing that we were talking about that. We've mentioned many times before, but it's still such a great way to get your foot in the door of a venue, especially in a town that you haven't been to yet with gig swapping, like finding a band in another city that has a following and offer to open up for them. And then in return, you know, do the same thing in your town Uh, that 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 tends to to work and. And usually get your at least get your foot in the door in a city that you may not have a way in since you're not there you're disconnected to that scene um so that that that's something that that tends to work and also um this was another thing that came up in the the chat that uh I've used multiple times in fact it was kind of the go to of how I was trying to get gigs uh here in Portland for Hello Morning is by putting together a compelling lineup and presenting that whole package to the club booker yeah, you save them pretty much almost all of the work of, of having to book a night. And the beauty of this is it allows you to be strategic. Like if you become friends with uh, you know some of the bands in your town that are doing well, um, it allows you to be strategic in that, you know, hey, I haven't played this club. I know these guys in, in these bands that do well there. Um, my audience maybe isn't uh, developed enough to handle carrying a night there on our own, but we'll gladly, you know, put together this bill that's going to not only benefit the venue, but benefit us by getting us in front of their audience. And, you know, a lot of bands will be like, Oh yeah, you're organizing a a show at this venue. Yeah, we'll play. And, uh, that's worked out well. Uh, when, when hello morning was playing a lot in Portland for us to get not only our foot in the door with venues and get to know those people and say, Hey, we played these, this bill, we helped put it together. The, the club was pretty much full. Um, but also get you in front of those people. And it's a way to kind of use the community of, of success, uh, to your advantage. Yeah. And if you're, um, kind of taking the opposite approach in a, in a, town that's you know far away from your own hometown where maybe you don't know who to gig swap with or you can't put the bill together because you don't have the the uh you're not in that community if you're just writing to the booker um trying to get a show then one tip that i always think is pretty wise is to write to clubs that are smaller than the type that you're used to playing so you know if you're you can fill a 300 capacity room in your hometown maybe be writing to 100 capacity rooms when you're touring um, cause suddenly your chances of getting people in the door are, uh, or of making the place look f- fuller than it would be, um, increased then. And, you know, it's better to sell out a small venue than to have a big empty, 
uh, giant rock club. So yeah, and you're and you're gonna feel better about the experience anyway, and and uh, you know, better connect with the fans. I mean, it's it's one of those things where you know, no matter how many people are in the room, you should always play your best. Um, people, I know it's. <laughs> A pet peeve of mine and many artists and also the audience when you start talking to the audience as if they are the people that didn't show up. <laughs> it's like, nobody's here. And they're like, nobody's what here. are you talking about? I'm here. here. I came. Maybe I should go home. Uh, but it's just that's like the, the such a good way to kill the energy for everyone. Like, yeah. The artists are pissed. Then the audience feels like they're not appreciated. And, and while you should act like a professional and play your best, it's still easier to have a good show when the room has more energy and at a smaller venue, you're going to have that opportunity to kind of build more energy in a smaller room, um, especially if it's your first time out on the road playing in that town. So that that is good advice to, you know, shoot for some smaller clubs. Yeah. And if you're trying to figure out, like you've say you've never been in San Francisco, so you don't know what the smaller clubs are, um, there's databases online and there's a site called Indie on the move that has club capacity numbers, you, um, you know, their photo gallery or their Facebook page to look at pictures, to get us, uh, you know, a sense for the size of the room. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a couple items that, uh, I, I thought of for like at the gig, you know, a lot of times, it, you know, people spend so much time talking about how do I get the attention of a, a club booker? And it's like, well, once you get in the door, that's just solving problem number one. The, the second thing is they want to know that you're not a pain in the butt to deal with. And I think this is where a lot of people can forget <laughs> that, you know, this may feel like a cool event for you, but for the, the people showing up to run the place, that's their job day in and out. And when they have to deal with uh, folks that are just a challenge, either uh, their whether it be attitudes or um, or that they just seem like beginners, that 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 makes their job no fun. So one thing that irritates me when I'm playing with other bands is when they like show up to the venue and they throw their gear all over the place, and it's like it's just this giant mess. And other people are trying to set up and move gear around, and, and it just becomes, you know, don't be that band. Keep yourself organized. Be paying attention. Be ready to go. Um, and uh, and practice your load in and setup so that you're not, you know, if your 15 minutes of setup time suddenly becomes 45 minutes, then no one's going to like you. Yeah, and yeah, it's like know how to get your entire band set up quickly, um, and especially like you know, for, I'm I'm the guitar player. You know, usually I'm set up earlier than the drummer. So it's like, hey, figure out how his setup works and help him set up, take care of cases, get everything cleared out and be ready to go. Um, there was there was a band that who will remain nameless that played one of our showcases, CD Baby showcases at South by Southwest. And the whole event ended up going an hour late and we had to beg the venue to not shut it down because they had something else starting it like 6 p.m. in the in the af- in the evening this was like an afternoon showcase they were literally setting up their ca- their cases were at the back of the room and they would walk to the back and like I'm not exaggerating pick up one cable and walk all the way to the front of the venue to the stage futz around with it and finally get it plugged in then walk back to the back of the room <laughs> pick up was this was this the same band that then only played for like 10 minutes I might have been, yes, because they, <laughs> they spent, they were, you know, and it was adequate setup time. We had like 25 minutes for setup and, uh, you know, they were, I think, a two or three piece band and it took them like 45, 50 minutes to set up and get all checked and everything. And so the whole thing went late. It's kind of the, the, the whole evening or event, I should say, took a, a drastic turning point. Um, the audience sort of got lost and and just kind of you know especially at south by southwest there's so much more to do that if you're going to be standing around for an hour that's like three bands you could have been seen so um so that people kind of drifted off and it just becomes a bummer and it just takes all the momentum out of the evening so so um, get your shit together that's right <laughs> um no one wants to babysit and 
Uh, the other thing is if you're in the, I, I found works very well as if somebody in the band is sort of the designated, I'm going to interface with the sound man. I'm going to go build rapport with them. I'm going to kind of tell them about our sound, give them a sense of who we are and that we appreciate them, uh, you know, doing some, uh, you know, adjustments for us. And it just kind of gets them on the, on the right footing for dealing with the band as opposed to their first interaction with the band is you yelling, I can't hear anything on my monitor. You know, <laughs> that, that's they're like, go introduce yourself. They're real people. Most yeah. Of, well, most one thing that, one thing that can kind of help out that too, is to also in advance of the show, have a, uh, stage plot ready, you know, just like a sheet of paper. It doesn't need to be anything fancy, just like kind of a little, uh, drawing of where you guys are on stage, what your gear is, maybe what your names are, what you need in terms of mics and stuff. And so then, you know, if you could just hand that to the sound person, then they don't have to do a whole lot of asking questions. They get a visual, yeah, uh, visual impression. Yeah. A um, couple more items. What, what have I've got on here that that we discussed? Um, there was a couple of like things that you would never think of, or people usually don't think of when they're going out on tour, and that's like uh, signing up with uh, the Automobile Club AAA is is a good idea because chances are you will break down and need to be towed at some point. <laughs> So you might as you might as well have AAA and pay a little bit than than uh, uh, get stuck with a massive massive bill for uh, having some help out on the road. Yeah, and it seemed to be the general consensus that it's not a real tour unless you've broken down. So I, I could do many podcasts on all our breakdown <laughs> adventures. Uh, another thing, actually, that you mentioned that it was I put kind of in the category of stuff that I most people don't think of. Uh, you had mentioned the idea of doing tour specific merchandise, which I think is a great idea. Oh yeah. And I think when I said that I was actually thinking of, um, Colin Malloy from the Decemberists, um, did some solo tours, like kind of in between Decemberist records. And I remember him having, um, cover song CDs for each, like, I think he did one for like a female folk singer. And then I think he did like a Sam Cook CD or something. I'm probably getting the artist wrong. But anyways, I just thought it was cool that every time he went out solo, he had a new new CD. No, I think that's a great idea that there's something new, especially, especially tour specific. Um, even if it's a tour shirt, uh, you know, you got to kind of gauge how many shows you're going to do. But at least every time you go around having, it doesn't, have to be specific to the tour, but it's that you have something new. Cause if you've got a lot of fans that are coming out to see you time and time again, and you still have that same shirt from three, you know, tours ago, they're not going to buy it cause they might already have it. Um, yeah. And also the idea if it's like something that sort of commemorates that actual tour and them being there is cool. Yeah. And if it's a music or video sort of release too, that's, that's unique to the tour, then you've got another way of getting press, um, for your shows too. Cause you know, it's an, it's another point of interest for people to write about. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, trying to make that actual tour special, even if you don't have a brand new, you know, full length album that you're doing the major promotion around having some sort of nugget of newness or interesting thing that you're doing at the show that's unique to that tour uh, will actually help things like press and just getting your fans to buy stuff or come out to the show because they're like, oh, they've they they tend to do something new every time and and you know fans like that. Uh, let's chat a little bit about some of the 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 advice that came up around uh, settling up uh, at the end of the <laughs> yeah. night. The the one thing that that I thought of after the conversation that I think is really critical for artists to remember is there is a good chance uh, that the person who is in charge of settling up with you at the end of the night had nothing to do with booking the show. So you can't assume that they know all the details of what was discussed when the show was booked. And I think that's just important mainly for one, uh, at the end of the night, when money comes out, people start to get attitudes or, or they want to get paid and go. And, and it's important to remember that, uh, you know, to, 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 to play it cool 
Um, and, uh, you know, if something comes up that wasn't what you agreed upon, that to not get uh, confrontational, but to right away, you, there may be times when you need to get <laughs> confrontational. <laughs> But the, to understand that this person may not be in the know, and if you just work that out, they go, oh, okay, I didn't realize you made this deal, and, and okay, yeah, so that's that's how it'll be. So that's one and, thing to really keep in mind. And if, if you put together a kind of like a tour binder or some sort of thing with all your itinerary and hotel, inform, you know, everything you need, you can also print up the emails too and just we'll be like, well, here's what we agreed to. Yeah. See, what, why is yeah, because that, that person is, you know, doing shows, you know, settling up shows every night and there's probably a typical thing that they do and they're always going to uh, probably um, go into this is a, just another typical deal mode, but there may be some things that were agreed upon. So that it's, you know, approaching that respectfully at the end of the night before you have to pull out the big guns and, you know, bring out the cricket bat and... and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Make I was trying happen. to think of what is that guy's name that has the cricket bat. I forget. Um, I watched the Spinal Tap like a couple weeks ago. So yeah, that, that show crack that movie cracks me up. <laughs> um, but uh, the the other thing with uh, settling up is to make sure that you know. That being said, approaching uh, you know very uh, professionally that. A lot of venues will provide a settle up sheet, and you do want to make sure there aren't any surprises on it. Um, or if there are surprises, that you know that that's what, how that venue works, and you may not want to play there again. Um, you know, the one venue that we always reference, uh, there's one here in Portland. They don't do it this way anymore, they've kind of cleaned up their act, but there's one of the premier clubs that holds like 300 people here in Portland. And, you know, you'd go backstage and, uh, the, there would be uh, catering in quotes, and it would be a bowl of chips and a bowl of salsa and a 12-pack of PBR. And then when you settled up at the end of the night, you'd get charged $150 for that. And you're just like, holy crap, how did – I mean, <laughs> if I went to Costco <laughs> with 150 bucks, I could get a month's <laughs> worth of all those items. <laughs> yeah, and then there'd be some dubious marketing charges. It'd be like $400 for marketing. Yeah. It'd be like, wait a minute. There's three bands on this bill. That's $1,200 just for tonight. You didn't spend that on marketing for this show. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, so they, they ended up sort of like having a base um, fee of like being 1000 to 1200 to $1,500 a night that the bands were, were paying for, which included some of the things that were normal, like staff and sound man and stuff. But it was... They've cleaned up their act since then. So that's something that, unfortunately, when that happened, it was like the premier club to play, and they kind of like were like their their mentality was, well, you got to deal with it. But then more clubs opened up in town, and they gave artists more options that had nice sounds and, and lights. And, and so they kind of had to uh, back down off of some of that stuff. And, you know, but that being said... It was one of those things when, you know, I, when Hello Morning first played there, I was like, oh, my gosh, they're charging us 150 bucks for chips and salsa. <laughs> but then as as we played there more, and especially when I talked to other bands that had played there a lot, they started going, you know, these are negotiable. If we're packing this club out, we can negotiate. And that's one thing that I think a lot of people f- forget, that once you start building an audience and you can deliver a, cl- a, a full room to a club or even a half full room, you have negotiating power, and don't forget that. That as long as you do it in a respectful way, be like, "Look, we've booked, we've played here multiple times, we've packed it out, we market it like crazy. Our email list is this big. You know, you you've seen that we will drive success. You need to work with us on this, and usually the venue will. And at least starting the conversation the first time, they might say no, but if you keep revisiting it, then chances are they'll start working with you. Yeah, that's a good one. You, it was uh, somewhere in there. You said something about the sounds and lights, which reminded me of when booking venues try to find ones that have a decent visual setup, uh, so that you can have you know photo and video opportunities while you're on tour as well. I know we kind of we probably make that point a lot, but you don't want to be in the corner of some sports bar with a bunch of like Red Sox games playing <laughs> above your head. Yeah, because then because then you're not gonna want to share those photos on Facebook or whatever. So no, you're not. No, you're not. It just yeah, yeah. It, it, and I have played that gig. 
<laughs> I've we've all played that gig many times. In fact, I played that gig while the opening ceremonies for the Winter Olympic, no, the the last Summer Olympics was on a giant screen to the side of the stage. I mean, <laughs> literally, it was like a six foot screen being projected on, you know. And uh, I was standing there playing, just watching the opening ceremonies, wishing I could hear what was being. <laughs> couldn't hear the audio from the feed, so yeah. So uh, that could have been a really cool visual combination if it had actually been played on like a screen above you, like that you guys had brought. And like, man, everyone's just really intently watching us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Uh, lots of, lots of great advice that, uh, artists were sharing on Twitter and we always, I always love hearing tour sto- tour stories. Cause I think, you know, some, you know, there's some of the best stories and, and things that happen. Musicians, I think are out on the road where it's just like that, that makes you feel some moments of triumph, moments of shame and mo- moments of humiliation, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully more moments of triumph and, and just, you know, and just good times. So it's always always fun to hear stories and people talking about their experiences with dealing people out on the road. And, and uh, well, speaking of dealing, there's uh, PJ Franco is one person that tweeted, do not tour. If you are not physically, mentally, or emotionally ready, learn to cope with your problems. So it's very basic, but I think touring can have the uh, effect of exacerbating your own issues or your, you know, interband issues. So yeah. yeah. When you get in a car in close, uh, living quarters with people. Um, if you don't like them or there's major conflict, that's going to be an uncomfortable situation. <laughs> <laughs> it will only get worse. It will only get worse. <laughs> and if so. you don't, here's another one. If you don't like touring, don't tour. Yeah, there, you know, There's YouTube and um, other ways to get your music out there. Yeah, when I was in college, all I wanted to do was get in a band and go out on the road because, like I said, I love traveling. I love road trips. Uh, my family did lots of road trips across the country growing up. And so I absolutely loved them. And I was shocked living in Nashville at, in college to find that there was a lot of musicians that would go out on tour and quit like after the first week, like playing, being a, you know, like a, a hired gun for a decent sized artist and getting paid night after night just because they couldn't stand being on the road. Uh, a lot of people have a hard time, you know, dealing with a new environment day after day. And, um, me, I loved it, but uh, but for some folks, yeah, they just can't handle touring. They don't like it, um, and if that's you, that that's okay. You don't have to tour. Um, there's some cool things, like you mentioned, on YouTube that, and, and other ways on the Internet that people are trying to build an audience that doesn't require getting in a van or a bus with people, so... The, the last thing we'll, we've got, we're going to post a, a blog article, like I mentioned, with a lot of this stuff because we're still adding to the list. And if you've got some things we should add to the list, feel free to hit us up on Twitter or email us or call our listener line. But uh, the last one I would say um, is that after the gig, say thank you to all the employees who were there that worked and then follow up with a thank you email to the club booker. You will not... Uh, believe how much traction that can get you with getting back to the venue. Um, if people say, hey, those guys were great to work with, and they they said thank you, and the club booker getting a thank you saying, you know, we had a great night, um, we can't wait to come back, thank you so much. And uh, I with, with Small Town Poets, we heard that over and over and over again on the road, that I had you guys back because you know what you I realized you guys were the only band that in my entire career of promoting shows has ever <laughs> written me thank you notes, <laughs> and uh, um, we heard that over and over again, and it's just amazing that you know working at a venue can be a thankless job. Uh, it's a lot of work leading up to the the show. It's a ton of work during the show, and you're the one person who definitely doesn't get to enjoy the show. <laughs> And then you got a lot of follow up at the end and, and the, just the artist saying thank you, it can go a long way. So that's that's the one piece of advice I would definitely leave the conversation on. My last piece of advice for sort of after the gig kind of tips would be, um, well, um, oh, geez, I'm forgetting his name now, uh, from the slants, Simon, right? Yeah, yeah, and he yeah. participated in the Twitter chat as well. Yes. Sorry, Simon. Uh, uh, he said, 
to get the serial numbers for all your gear, keep track of them. And then um, this wasn't from the conversation, but I have another friend on Facebook who said, you know, my heart goes out to all of you people recently who've had your gear stolen, but, you know, for God's sakes, stop leaving it in the van. Like, if your guitar is that priceless or whatever, you know, that essential, bring it into your hotel room. Like, yeah, because uh, we had like a string of mutual friends that um, over the past couple months we've had their gear stolen, and it's basically because they left it in their van at night. Yeah, or they left it in the trailer. I, I fortunately, I have not been in a band where our gear was stolen, but I've known so many people who that's been the case, um, and it usually comes down to leaving the trailer in a place where someone could easily put it on their own vehicle or not backing the trailer up. So, uh, the doors are kind of against a wall of a building or, you know, yeah, just take, take care of your gear. Cause nothing will just take the wind out of your sails by having all that stuff stolen. And it's hard to recover. It's, it's hard to get somebody to help you. I've had gear stolen out of my apartment, um, but not out on the road. <laughs> Yeah, what a bummer, because then you have to probably go and give your money to Guitar Center or something like that the next yeah, day. To... Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so take care of yourself out there on the road. If you know the, the, it, And if you've got advice, we'd love to hear it. If you've got stories, we love stories. Um, it's always fun to hear fun tour stories, success stories, some um, stories of things going poorly, um, things that did well. We love hearing that. Uh, so... If you'd like to add to our list that we're going to be posting, you can email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com or call our listener line at 360-524-2209 or you can hit us up on Twitter. And uh, yeah. I, I just thought of something. I don't know if you were planning on mentioning it, but we the discount on merch. Did oh, yes, have- yes. In the, have- for the month of April... This is April 2015. I know a lot of people will discover the podcast and binge listen to all the episodes. And so when they listen to it might be months after something's happened. But for the month of April 2015, if you go to Merchly, it's merch.ly. Um, and uh, what is the coupon code? I th- it's, is it T's 10? Oh, yeah. T's 10. T-E-S 10. As in T-shirts. T's 10. If you use that when you check out, you'll save 10%. And uh, Merchly is great. I used it myself for the Small Town Poets Tour. I did a lot of shopping around and uh, tried out different sites and pricing. And the prices at Merchly are great. And it has a great interface to, to build your shirt. And the best part is the shirt looked exactly like it was supposed to when I got it delivered. So... Um, yeah, if, you, if you're heading down the road and need merch, check that out. We're doing that this month. And if you're on our email list for CD Baby, you'll be getting that offer in, the e- in your email this month as well. So, Yeah, and we've got a really good article about uh, merch and how to set up your merch booth to kind of maximize CD and T-shirt sales when you're on tour. Um, that is on the DIY Musician blog. Yep, so check it out. It's definitely heading into touring season and uh, time to start making all those things happen. So, all right. Well, Chris, I, I it was great seeing you this week. Yeah, and it was. It was so nice. And you know, I forgot to tell you this. It was so nice in Oregon. It was like fifties and sixties, and that nice moist air, and everything was green. And I came back here. It was snowing when I landed. <laughs> it's still snowing in Maine. Just in case anyone was wondering. Um. Yeah, you've spent most of the winter buried under mountains of snow, like <laughs> literal mountains of snow. <laughs> yeah, nine feet. Yeah. Right now, it's only a few inches. But oh, it's, you know, you know, that'd be, a, that'd be a blizzard here in Portland. So, um, All right, well, well, we'll be watching the launch of your, your Pledge Music campaign as well. And uh, yeah, that's going to do it. All right, we'll, we'll see Catch ya. you next time. Take it easy. Bye. Seemed pretty good. Yeah, I think that was good.
You've been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. 